sentence yet before we go on into the message. <clears throat> if not, let's uh, stand then and we'll read the text together. It's from 1 Samuel, chapter 15, verse 34 through sixteen thirteen. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house in Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel went no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. But the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me the one I name to you. So Samuel did what the Lord said, and he went to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. So it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all the young men here? Then he said, There remains yet the youngest, and there he is, keeping the sheep. Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, with, a bright, with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, Arise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day and for this time of worship and fellowship. Thank you for each one who is present here with us today. Lord, most of all, we thank you for your presence. And we ask that you would teach us, speak to our hearts today, as only you can. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> Certainly one thing in uh, Scripture is clear, and that is that... Um, Things often start very small. Here was a young man who was not known. And even Samuel's presence in town made them afraid. Because why would such an important man come to an unimportant town? And uh, so everyone was a bit of stir and they trembled. They were concerned, worried, wondering what was up. But God was about to do something really great and starting with, a young lad, I don't know how young he was, but it's like the text that uh, was read this morning about the seed sown in the ground. It can start very small, but when God is in it, it's no telling what's going to come of it. And that's true of each one of our lives and certainly true of things that the Lord begins to initiate in us. In, our, in the context of our, um, of our scripture today in 1 Samuel, we have uh, Saul being rejected by God. And it was probably due to several things, but one thing in particular. First of all, um, when he was going out to battle, he wanted to sacrifice to the Lord, and he called Samuel to come and do the sacrifice, but Samuel didn't show up right when he was supposed to, and so Saul took it upon himself to do the sacrifice, for which Samuel very severely rebuked him. And, um, and basically you know, sort of pronounced a curse on Saul because of it. But the thing that really made God reject Saul was the fact that he had told him to go and punish the Amalekites. And the Amalekites were those who had troubled the Israelites as they were fleeing from Egypt. They kept attacking them from behind and things like that. Whenever they could, they would come and attack them and kill them and, and just 
made, the, made it miserable for them. And uh, remember the story of uh, Moses and, uh, see, was it, um, it was Aaron and Hur, I think it was, who stood under Moses' arms, and they were fighting the Amalekites, see? And as long as Moses had his arms up like this, Israel would win. When he got tired, his arms came down, then the Amalekites would win. And so Aaron and Hur stood under his arms and raised his arms up, and they defeated them. The Amalekites in Scripture are a type of our carnal nature. As I recall, they are children of uh, Ishmael. Ishmael was Abraham's firstborn. And the firstborn is our carnal nature. And the Amalekites were not to be given any quarter. Saul's orders were to kill them, men, women, and children, oxen, sheep, everything. Destroy absolutely everything. And you know that's how it is with our carnal nature. You give it an inch, and it'll take 20 miles, not just one. And, um, and it's to be fought. It's to be overcome. It's to be destroyed without quarter. The flesh... There's no good thing, the Bible says, that lives in our flesh, in our carnal nature. And um, so we're always at war. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is at war with, the, with our flesh, our carnal nature. The flesh and the Spirit are lusting against each other. And, and God is very uncompromising when it comes to this carnal nature, this embodiment of sin that, that Adam received when he uh, fell and fell into sin. And it's really to establish something very, very um, forcefully for us. And that is the, the nature of God against sin. There is absolutely no tolerance and no compromise. And uh, he will not make peace with it in any way, shape, or form ever. Not forever and ever. And we need to really know that. And so the first part of Scripture which has to do with the time before the law, uh, really is, is uh, written to in reinforce that and to help us to understand that. Samuel is sort of in a transition. We have uh, three kings here, which are very interesting, Saul and David and Solomon, and they all three represent like epochs in history. Saul represents the time before the law, when everyone did that which was right in his own eyes. That's what Saul was doing. If he went to battle and thought, well, let's save the best of the sheep and the cattle, even though God had said destroy them all, they did. They just did what they thought was right in their own eyes. And um, if he wanted to sacrifice, he did, you know, regardless of what God had said. So that's how it was during the time of the judges. And Samuel is the last of the judges and the first of the prophets, really. And um, so there's this, in this transition time, David, the king, represents the time of the law. His rule was absolute law and justice. And he, because of it, shed a tremendous amount of blood. And he was not allowed to build a temple because of it, because he had a lopsided, he presented a sort of a lopsided view of God, that of just absolute justice and law and, and so on. But um, so Solomon was allowed to build the temple because he was a man of peace. And um, we'll maybe say more about that. But... Um, But I was reading recently in um, uh, Bone of His Bone, um, can't say the author's name right now. But anyway, uh, he was saying that as long as the flesh life is, is healthy and alive, it's like a railroad track straight into your life for sin. You know, that's what, those are the rails that sin runs on, is that self-life that, um, that is protected and kept and ruled. See, Agag is like that thing that rules self. And um, that's a high place or some place in us that, um, that is allowed to be in control, that is still allowed to rule us. I'd like to uh, just go back and read Samuel's question to, uh, to King Saul when Saul was trying to defend what he had done. He said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? See, Saul's excuse was that it brought them to make a sacrifice. Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, 
and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you've rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. So if you want to know how God feels about sin, take a look at Samuel. Hacking Agag to pieces. Absolutely no, no compassion. No uh, permissiveness. N no nothing. It's just, it has to be destroyed. It is an enemy that uh, will destroy us and destroy the world if we let it. And God has no um, regard for sin as a principle. It is, it is total, he is totally at enmity with it. It's a picture of his justice without redemption. You know, the Bible talks about the end times when the wine, when, God, when, the, when the cup of God's wrath is, um, is um, without mixture. That's what this is a picture of, sort of. But none of us knows what that looks like. The wrath of God, not mixed with anything else, just the wrath of God against sin. And, but we need to know that. We need to have that in our minds because apart from that, nothing else means anything. Sacrifice of Jesus doesn't mean what it ought to mean until we understand what justice is, until we understand God, how God feels about sin. His goodness to us, his kindness and all those things don't mean anything to us don't mean what they ought to mean until we really get a picture of God's justice without redemption. Jesus came and justice was meted out, but it was meted out on him. He is the one who took God's wrath for us on our behalf. He suffered for us. And, um, but when Agag was dealt with, there was no, no one to... Um, take his place. So God sent Jesus, and a, and a great price was prayed, paid so that we might know God as our Father and not just as our judge. So we could know his kindness and uh, his goodness toward us. God did call David a man after his own heart, and there were a number of reasons for this, no doubt. One of them was that David delighted, he loved God and delighted in God. And um, it comes out in all the psalms that he wrote. And, and um, uh, he became a prophet, actually. He prophesied some of the most wonderful prophecies in Scripture. One of them Jesus used. And in fact, it is the most, I think, I haven't counted it up, but I think it's the most often quoted Scripture in the New Testament from the Old Testament. And that is that the Lord said to my Lord, sit on my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And it's quoted over and over again. And once uh, Jesus quoted it himself to the scribes and Pharisees, and he said, because they understood that the Lord said to my Lord, the second Lord, first Lord is God. So God said to my Lord, David is saying, well, who's David's Lord? He is the Messiah. And they understood that. So Jesus' question to them was, if David called him Lord, how could he be his son? And they couldn't answer. But of course we know, because... He was both the son of David and the son of God. And so, um, so the Lord said, and that has to do with conquering evil. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, ascend to the very throne of God, sit at my right hand to make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And those enemies, of course, are sin itself and those that, um, that promote it. <clears throat> but he was the sweet singer of Israel. That's sort of how his story closes in... Um, in 2 Samuel, they called him the sweet singer of Israel. He wrote many psalms. However, David was only a shadow cast by a rising sun. When we talk about shadows in the Bible, uh, Hebrews uses the term shadow. It's the shadow that's cast by the rising sun. It was before. It's the shadow that comes before. And so uh, David was a shadow of Christ, the true Son of God, who was the Son that every father would want. The Son that absolutely pleased the Father in every respect. He was um, 
Uh, he had an uncompromising devotion to duty. He did everything absolutely right. Everything that pleased the Father, that was his rule. And um, he, um, he had an uncompromising devotion to duty. But I think most importantly, as a king, in his uh, kingly role, uh, he'd never make peace with the enemies of God. But his purpose is to conquer all. <clears throat> However, David was not allowed to build the temple. Uh, the Lord said that he had shed too much blood. And um, that's sort of surprising in a way when you think about some of the testimony. David was so devoted to duty and to doing what was right that he refused to take personal vengeance. I mean, how many times did he let Saul escape when it seemed like God had delivered him into his hand because he knew in his heart that it was wrong to kill somebody who was the Lord's anointed. And so he refused to do it. And even refused to take personal vengeance on, on people that had wronged him very deeply. Until, of course, um, when Solomon came into power, they told Solomon about it and said, now you know what you need to do. And we always think of Solomon as a man of peace. But he began, he was, his kingdom was established under him by taking very severe vengeance on uh, David's enemies. And um, so, um, <clears throat> so anyway, David was not allowed to build the temple, but Solomon, being a man of peace, built the temple. Of course, um, we know what the temple is. The temple is us. We are the temple of the living God. And the Old Testament temple was a type of that. But what I would like to emphasize today, as I think about Father's Day, is that the foundation of Christianity is moral certainty and fixed absolutes. There is no substitute for that in a good father to not only have moral certainty, but to embody it, that it, it what governs our life, that there is moral certainty and and uh, absolutes that we are responsible for certain things and we will give an account for them. And that is true. That's, uh, that was our scripture in 2 Corinthians. That we know that every one of us will give an account of himself to God. And so there, is, there are these fixed absolutes and clear standards. Um, part of that is a, an unquestioning faith in God. Now... <clears throat> You know, we may disagree somewhat as to what some of those standards are and as to what really is right and wrong. I believe that the scriptures certainly make a lot of that very clear, but, but that we have that. We have that sense that there are things that are right that will always be right under every circumstance. And there are things that are wrong that will always be wrong under any circumstances. And we need to have that as a foundation for our lives. That's what makes everything else have meaning. And in a world that has lost its, uh, lost its direction, it's what we need. It's what we need to come back to, that there are moral absolutes. I, read a, um, I watched a video actually recently of an economist who was very sad, very dejected. And he said that sooner or later, this whole thing's going to collapse. And he said the reason for it is that we don't have the moral character to make the difficult decisions that we need to make. The lack of moral character in finances is tied to the lack of moral character in anything. You know, if we don't have moral character, we can't make moral choices that cost us. We'll always take the easy way, and um, in the short run anyway, the, um, the way that costs the least. <clears throat> but this kind of foundation of moral right and wrong gives meaning to everything that follows. It gives meaning to the message and sacrifice of Jesus. And in any culture where moral absolutes are absent, uh, the descent into chaos is inevitable. And it'll be both in government and in uh, the um, people. You know, when, when you do away with moral absolutes, chaos is going to be the... Um, the result, and that was certainly true in the time of the judges. If you want to know what it looks like, 
to not have moral absolutes, go back and read the judges. And when everybody just did what was right in their own eyes, and it's like going back to our own history. I know I talk about this a lot, but it's true. It's so hard for us to remember where we came from. And scripture says, remember the hole of the pit whence you're digged and the rock whence you're hewn. Well, the hole of the pit that we came out of was a hole of paganism. All the white race are Caucasians, we're Celts. All you have to do is go back and see where we came from. Without moral absolutes, that's where we're headed. You know, it might look much more sophisticated, but, but still the same. Spirit is the same, and, and the result is the same. Utter, absolute chaos. That's why they call us barbarians, you know. So, Goths and Visigoths and all the rest of it, that's where we came from. In the absence of moral absolutes, all humanitarian efforts become a license for irresponsibility and further selfishness. Does that make sense? Without moral absolutes, every act of kindness is just a license for irresponsibility and further selfishness. What I see God doing in the lives of David and Solomon and using them as a um, example of building the temple. See, David had a real hand in building the temple. He stored up things, and uh, much of what Solomon used was things that David had provided and alliances that David had made. Like David had this great alliance with the king of Tyre and um, Hiram, and so who was a great figure in building the uh, the temple, but. Um, so David had a huge hand in it, but he was not allowed to do it by himself because that wouldn't have been. That's not what builds peace and prosperity and, and just the wonder of goodness that God wants to pour out on his people. Uh, that came in Solomon's time. It had a foundation of law and order, but it also had a lot of big heartedness and generosity and, and um, all those things that, um, that um, contribute to freedom. There are many places in the world today where people are, the big things in their lives are orders and closed doors. You know, you take orders and there's not many opportunities. For us, you know, it's, um, we have many options and we have lots of opportunities. But many places in the world and usually it's in places where uh, law and order are not respected. And finally it comes down to some dictator who takes a hold and people let him because they want some kind of semblance of order. Um, Greek right now is, is, I'm not sure if it's today that they're going to the polls. And um, if they don't go along with this austerity thing, you know, you can expect more chaos until some dictator takes over. And remember, Greece once ruled the world, the civilized world at least. So um, it wasn't pretty then, it wouldn't be pretty now either. But, um, but anyway, that's, it's just inevitable, that's the way history has gone. That uh, when there's an absence of law and order, chaos is the result and then um, the law and order that comes in is going to be very selfish and very um, uh, rigid. <clears throat> the balance of David and Solomon is moral responsibility and cheerful, good-humored unselfishness. You know, that's the balance. And that's what promotes true freedom and prosperity. I'd like to um, pay tribute to my own father a little bit today because um, in a way he sort of embodied this. My dad was far from perfect and um, and that's the way dads are. And I'd like to say to you that uh, if you have a dad that's not perfect, uh, no, just join the crowd, you know. We all had dads that are not perfect. But uh, thankfully for me, my father did have some very strong attributes, and, um, and I'm very thankful for them. One of them was that he was very strict. My dad was really strict. And it didn't matter how many times uh, he found my transistor radio and it's hidden in the hay or in the barn somewhere, he always destroyed it. You could count on it, or a guitar, or whatever it happened to be that we weren't supposed to have. 
And um, he never said, oh, it's okay, you can now have a transistor. No way. My dad was against it. And I knew if he ever found it, it was going to get crushed, you know. And so that's just how he was. He, um, but, um, but also, one thing about my dad I'd like to talk about today was that our home was far from run like a military camp. It just wasn't, you know. But there were things about it that were unbending. And so, um, but one of the things my dad loved was good food. He just loved good food, and especially pork. He, uh, he loved sausage and bacon and ham. And, and I always marvel at, at them, how they managed to do it. You know, it's like my dad always fed the pigs. We children had our jobs from the time we were six years old. And there was a bunch of us, you know. We had to work together to make it work. But uh, from the time I was six, I think I had to fill the wood box. And you sort of graduated from that. And then ones younger coming up, they would take over your job and you moved up. And so from there, we went to like feeding the chickens, to bottle feeding the calves, to feeding the cows, to milking, and finally to field work, you know, where we didn't have to do milking anymore and that kind of thing. But, but it was just, um, you know, it was just, we all sort of knew how the system worked and, and we just sort of did that. But, um, but my dad always fed the pigs. None of us ever fed the pigs. And, you know, he was very careful about how he fed them. And, and I know that when he looked at them, he didn't see just pigs. He saw a bunch of happy kids, you know, sitting around his table, eating all this good food that he was envisioning was going to come. And um, he, he would smoke his own bacon and make his own sausage. I remember him and mom, I never forget, they, you know, there wasn't any recipe, so I, know, I don't have a recipe, and it really bothers me. But, um, but they would taste it, you know, and they would say, well, I think it needs a little bit more of this or that. And what they would do is they would, they would have this uh, sausage they were mixing and they would fry a little bit because we had this wash house, butcher house, smoke house combination. It was really the wood house, the woodshed too. It was all connected together. Really neat setup. And um, so they would have this fire going and they would, um, you know, make a little sausage patty and they would eat it and they'd decide what else it needed yet, you know. But it was absolutely the best. I, I told Kay often that if we could um, can sausage like my mom used to can, there's nothing like it in the world. We'd get rich. But we don't know how to do it, you know. We didn't stay there long enough. So, um, so anyway, he would, um, he would do this. And he would go out and pick the very best ears of corn. And he'd bring them in and dry them. And, and uh, you know, it wasn't a big fanfare or anything, but... Evenings when we were sitting around playing games and stuff in the winter, he'd be shelling corn, just sitting in the corner there, just shelling corn, you know. Then he would take it out in the kitchen and put it in the oven and toast it to just a golden brown, you know, until he had a big bag of it. And then he would take it out in the barn to our hammer mill and grind it. And that was our cornmeal, and there's nothing like it in the world, you know. Absolutely the best cornmeal you could ever taste. And he'd mix it in the scrapple from the pork, and it was just, there's nothing like it in the world. I mean, it's just, that's the way, it, you know, it's just absolutely special. Well, that was my dad. And he died at 71 from heart disease, but uh, what a way to go. You know? <laughs> I mean, he, he lived a good life. He really did. It was, um, it was amazing. And uh, how he learned to do all that, I, I don't know. But I think, it, I think he really wanted to. It was something he took an interest in. But I think my dad took a great deal of pleasure from having us all sitting around the table and having it loaded with food, just the best food. We never had much money, but man, we lived high on the hog. I mean, not just the hog either. We had other meat too, but, <laughs> but um, we had good food and lots of it. Mom would, uh, she was the uh, commander of the garden, but, um, but dad is the one who would get the meat in, you know, it was just amazing. My own world is much larger than my dad's world, you know? It is much more complicated. My dad's world was very small. It had to do with our uh, church community there and his family and, you know, that was, those were the two biggies. And it um, wasn't too much else. We interacted some with the community, but not a great deal. But, um, but as I said, my own world is, became much larger, and it became much more difficult to um, have that sense of moral certainty that my dad had, you know? 
He, had, he didn't have a whole lot of rules, but the ones he had were very rigid. And I think I did my children a disservice by, um, by just not being sure, you know, where to draw the line sometimes. And, um, and that, that makes children insecure. They need to know, they really want to know where the lines are. And, and I think it's important for us to, um, for each one of us individually even, to, to know where that is. The things that are always going to be wrong, no matter what the circumstances are, and the things that are always right, no matter what the circumstances are. We live in a world that's searching for meaning. And the one thing that I have um, morally is that I am absolutely convinced that God's way is perfect as it is revealed in Jesus Christ. You know, I am absolutely convinced of that. However we can apply that to our world, um, it's no easy task. And certainly we need God's spirit to guide us and help us. But I know that God's way is perfect. Jesus had no tolerance for fools or for hypocrites. But at the same time, his was a message of truth, a message of life, a message of freedom. And most of all, it was a message of love. You know, that's how we live. That's our life. But we need a foundation from which to live. And that foundation is moral certainty. The very character and nature of God is our standard. Jesus said, be therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And um, if we're convinced of that, if we're convinced that he is perfect, that gives us a moral um, foundation from which to live. And I believe that the more we live by our faith, the more we can expect the, to experience the censure of a world that is adrift. True north, for me, is the character and nature of God. You know, we can set our compass on that. Who God is, the way he is. I was, um, this morning off the, um, someone sent us a thing on, um, I think it was on Facebook, maybe Kay was showing it to me. It's about my father, and it's talking, of course, about God. He loves me, cares for me. All these have scriptures with them. He forgives me, is giving, is understanding, is accepting. He satisfies, pursues me. He's reasonable. He pardons wrong. He heals me, redeems me. He is loving kindness. He renews me, is righteous, is gracious, is sovereign. You know, there's a couple of moral absolutes here. He is righteous, he is sovereign, um, but we really need to have that in our hearts. We really need to get that, you know, before the other really can be meaningful to us. <clears throat> so when we set our moral compass as fathers, certainly um, one of the first things on my list would be personal moral responsibility and accountability. To know that I will give an account to God for who I am, not just for what I do, but for who I am. And to know that um, uh, we will answer to him. And that's, um, that's all taken in the light of what Jesus did, you know, and what he gives to us. Uh, who I am as a Christian depends on him. I know that. But it's also a reflection of my choices and how much I'm willing to go to him and depend on him. The second thing I would say is the preeminence of family. The importance of it. That we are convinced that family is God's way. And the importance of clear role models uh, to provide for one's own and to delight in it. Uh, to be willing to work hard and, and to lay down our lives. That's that's really uh, the biblical expression of love. Um, in counseling people uh, uh, for marriage, you know, it's not the romance, although that's wonderful and it's um, really a good thing. But that's not what carries a marriage through and makes it successful. What, what really makes marriage successful is true love, which is 
being willing to lay down our life for each other, for the family. Jesus said, that's love, to lay down your life for others. And, um, and that's what really makes a happy, contented, blessed family, is when we are doing, doing that for one another. The third thing I would list would be the dignity of work and the work-reward ratio. You know, that I can work for things and expect to reap the rewards of it. And, um, and that I shouldn't expect things if I'm not willing to work for them. And that it's very, um, that honest work is a, um, a very high value. The fourth thing is the merit of service and social responsibility. Devotion to a purpose greater than oneself that we owe something to the larger community and we need to take care of others in a way like we take care of our family, that we need to care about others. But uh, family comes first and this is like that. It's come second, but it's, uh, it's still like that, that we're willing to sacrifice for the greater good. And then fifth is the value of a good education. <clears throat> Brookings Institute did a study recently, and I got this off uh, online as well, that um, those who graduate high school, get a full-time job, marry before their first child, 2% of them are poor, living below the poverty level. Where this is not true, 76% are poor. Culture makes a difference. And culture is a reflection of deeply held beliefs and values. So, um, so this is just a, um, um, another reflection of what it means to have a good foundation. A good father is not only a teacher, but he is a moral representative. He is like he embodies these things. Moral responsibility, selfless service. And I'd like to close with this thought, just to um, give us something to think about. As I was thinking about this message this week and Father's Day, I um, all of a sudden thought, and I really have to tell you the truth, I haven't come up with an answer yet. But the, this is the question that came to me. What would God like for a Father's Day present? You know? <laughs> and uh, I've, thought, I've thought quite a bit about that. But maybe it's a very personal thing. What would God like from you for a Father's Day present? Because he is the perfect father. You know, um, when we um, understand him and understand his, um, the reason for his sort of rigid moral absolutes, you know, and we understand the security that that gives us and the blessing that it is, it's like they almost never come into play. The rest of it is all just him pouring out his goodness and his delight on us. He loves us. He's not uh, this um, person who's always waiting to come down on you with a hammer. It's not that way at all. But, you know, the hammer usually comes down due to our own sin. We're just suffering for our own failures. But not always. Sometimes God does bring it. You know, people ask the question sometimes, how can God allow this? A much deeper question, much dip more difficult one, is why would God bring this on us? Because he does sometimes. You know, I said a little bit ago, sort of in jest, about how the Greeks once ruled the world. They might have ruled it a great deal longer if Antiochus Epiphanes had not sacrificed a pig on the altar in the temple. Those kind of things, when you thumb your nose at God like that, doesn't go unnoticed. And neither will our forms of blasphemy, you know. They won't go unnoticed. And one day we might be asking, you know, why did God bring this on us? Because um, he is God after all, and the world in chaos is not God's idea of a nice world, a good world. It's not what he's trying to build. God wants a world that is based on law and order, that is full of his goodness and love and grace, kindness and sharing and 
all those wonderful things that he wants to give us. But uh, we won't have that if we thumb our nose at his character and nature and his hatred for sin. So I hope that it helps us to remember our own fathers. Because I think we all, us older ones especially, came from a generation that had much more of a sense of moral absolutes. And, um, and we can be thankful for that. But um, a challenge also to the younger generation. If you want a good life, get a good foundation. And, um, and you will have it. So God bless you, each one those who are fathers, those who bless the memory of our fathers. I don't know how to say that exactly, but those who will become fathers, you know. It's, um, it is a wonderful life, and it's a great responsibility, but it is truly, uh, truly a blessing. <clears throat> I, this morning on Facebook, um, this is what Kay, Kay is the Facebook person in our family. She keeps me in touch with everybody, and... Um, and she said, uh, she showed me this picture of, that Julie, had, our daughter, had posted with myself holding two of the grandchildren and one in front of me. And, well, that's about as good as it gets. You know, it's just about as good as it gets. So, um, God bless you. And that's, that would be my wish for each one of you. A happy family, prosperous, blessed, um, all the good things. That's what I want for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time together as a small group, remembering our fathers and remembering you as our Heavenly Father. And Lord, I have to say that I am so grateful for the many times when I felt your strength, when you were uncompromising, no matter how much I would um, protest. But um, you still took us through those things that were so important to our life and our spiritual development. So we thank you for that. But we thank you too for all the wonderful kindnesses that you showed, the grace that you give daily. And um, we're only sorry that we don't see it more often because it's evident everywhere and in so many places and we often are just blind to it and are too busy to stop and see it. We ask you to forgive us for that, but open our hearts and minds today. Open our eyes to your goodness that we see everywhere around us, and may we rejoice in it and uh, promote it in every way that we can. Help us, Lord, to be a true representative of, uh, for you. We are called to be your ambassadors. I pray that we could be a true representative, that we would embody both principle and also sacrificial love. And may that be true for each one of us, and especially for us as fathers, we pray in Jesus.